Good morning, everyone. Welcome back after your nice holiday. I hope you all had a restful holiday. I hope you didn't check your email in four days. Um, we're going to get right started with Sarah. Very exciting day today. We are recording this and there'll be a code at the completion of this for you to take uh, into consideration for your hours. And uh, I will look at questions in the chat box and we'll go through them after Sarah's presentation. So thank you, Sarah. Okay, let's go to share screen and we will start. Okay, let's see. I need to get my everything out of the way so that I can share my show. Oops, there. All right, so we've made it to week three and this is the second part of the child find to eligibility piece of the program. As you know, last week we talked about the list of requirements under the IDEA. Last week, if anyone can remember pre-Thanksgiving, we did locating and identifying. Then we took a little pause where we talked about records. And then this week we're going to pick up the little timeline here with evaluating and determining eligibility. Then in the next couple of weeks, we'll move on to developing the IEP and working on placement issues. Okay, so when we last stopped, there had been a referral made to the IEP team. So what happens next? The IEP team needs to determine if or what evaluations are needed to determine eligibility and, if eligible, programming. So the IEP then gets informed consent from the student's parent. The evaluations are conducted pursuant to the directives of the IEP team. And then the IEP team meets to determine eligibility and, if they're determined eligible, the IEP team moves on to develop the IEP. Okay, so the first thing we need to think about is after the referral, are evaluations needed? And the IEP team needs to make this decision. And to do that, the IEP team has to start by reviewing whatever existing information about the child it has. They might get information from the parent, evaluations that the parent had through the medical system, depending on where the child has been spending his or her time, there might be some classroom-based observations, and you might actually already have formal or informal assessments. So let's stop at this point for a moment and think this through. It is entirely possible that the IEP team will have nothing more at the referral point than a parent who can always refer saying, I think there's something that's not right here. I don't feel like my child is the same or is behaving like the other kids her age. Or when I see my friend's kids, my child just doesn't seem like they're doing the same things. So that might be all of the information that you have as an IEP team. At that point, you need to order evaluations. In other words, you can't delay a referral by a parent by saying, well, you know, all this is is a parent saying she's worried where all this is, is my kid isn't like the next door neighbor's kid. That's not how it works. You can't delay a referral from a parent by saying, oh, well, we'll screen your kid. Oh, well, 
we'll put your, you know, we'll take a look at your kid, but we won't call it an evaluation. No, 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 no. At this point, you have to determine what, if any, evaluations are needed. And in a case where you don't have much, if anything, how could you say no? In other words, unless you are absolutely certain just from the parent report as an IEP team that there is nothing here, then you order evaluations. Now, user and IDEA say that this first IEP team discussion does not have to be a meeting. It can be a series of discussions between IEP team members. But let's unpack that for a couple of minutes. First, it's absolutely critical that the parent is part of anything you do. In other words, if you decide not to have a meeting, that doesn't mean you can make the decision without the parent. The parent has to weigh in and be a part of the discussions about whether and what evaluations you're going to do. Second thing about this, in Maine, we've seen a couple of due process hearings on this issue. So if you decide not to have an IEP team meeting, you're gonna do it based on discussions. You risk not evaluating in all areas of suspected disability. The benefit to bringing the IEP team together at the very beginning for a meeting is you wanna flush out at that meeting all areas of suspected disability. You want to hear from the parent. If there's been an educator involved because they've been in an educational setting, you want to hear from them. You want to suss out what is going on so that the evaluations you order are in all areas of suspected disability. So I was talking with Roberta and Erin about this. I have an IDEA theory that really the most pressure and the most significance about how to do this correctly is front loaded. In other words, the decisions you make about getting initial evaluations and determining eligibility and setting a plan in the LRE in place is going to guide everything else that happens fake wise. And so to me, it's critical that you spend the time and the attention to doing this first bit of work because everything else, compliance-wise, FAPE-wise, will follow from it. So why are you doing evaluations? Does the child have a disability? What is it? What are the child's present levels of performance? Are there accommodations or modifications that can be made to the regular education environment? Does the child need special education or related services? Now you'll see below my little line, is the child making progress? Does the child continue to need special education or related services? Those are for another time, right? If we're talking about initial eligibility decisions, you need to know does the child have a disability? What is it? Present levels of performance. If there are accommodations and modifications that should be being made in the regular education environment. And ultimately, does the child need special education and related services? Okay, so once you get this process started, timelines start kicking in. The IEP team must determine what, if any, additional evaluations are needed to determine if the child's a child with a disability and send a consent to evaluate form within 15 school days of the receipt of the referral. So remember last week when I told you how important it was to determine when a referral is a referral and start the clock? That's because from the time that a referral is received, and by CDS policy, that means in writing received by the site director or a designee, you have 15 school days to 
make the determination as an IEP team about evaluations and send the consent to evaluate form. So let's talk through this consent idea. Obviously, you have to obtain parental consent prior to evaluation. Remember from last week that a screening, in other words, a large group event where you're looking at all different students, not the same as evaluation. Under IDEA 2004, there's a special requirement that if a child is a ward of the state, you attempt to obtain consent from either the biological or adoptive parent. Now, if the parent refuses to consent to an evaluation, an LEA, CDS, may, but is not required to use due process to obtain authority to evaluate. So here's where it gets a little tricky. If you're in public school, you have a direct motivation to determine whether or not a student needs additional assistance, right? Because the students are in your school, they're in your classrooms, and you know that they're struggling or you're noticing things that are troubling and you want to be able to support them. CDS is a little different in the sense that some of the students who are referred to you are not already in a public school program. And so if parents decide after a referral, and you know, the referral could come from a community member or a medical professional, that they simply aren't interested and don't want to go down the evaluation path, it's a little bit different calculation because the student isn't already in your program or school. So what does consent mean? Because every once in a while, there's a due process around whether or not the parent really gave consent. So the parent has to be fully informed in their native language or mode of communication of all of the information about the action for which they're giving consent. The parent has to understand and agree in writing to the action and that consent describes the action and lists the records, if any, that will be released and to who. The parent needs to understand that IDEA 2004 is specific. Consent is voluntary and can be withdrawn at any time, but be aware that withdrawal of consent is not retroactive. So in other words, if you already have consent to do something and start doing it, you can finish it even if the parent withdraws consent for future activities. Okay, let's think about the timeline again. Sending the consent to evaluate form pauses the timeline. I mean, put another way, there's no timeline by which the parent has to return the consent form. So now I'm gonna be a little practical here, right? You've sent the consent form and you hear nothing. What do you do next? Well, I would argue, although there's not a specific place in Muser that says you have to do this, that you need to follow up with the parent if a reasonable amount of time passes and you don't hear anything. Obviously, because the parent is part of the meeting that decides what evaluations need to be done, at some point, the parent was engaged in the process and now you've sent the consent form and you haven't heard anything. So follow up, make a phone call, send an email if you have an email address, but there's no official timeline running here. So I need to go back for a second because I learned about something this morning that I didn't know existed before. And I want to talk about how it fits, or more appropriately, how it doesn't fit into this process. Oh, there's a feline. Now, see if Fape Cat weren't so lazy. Fape Cat, by the way, overate on Thanksgiving epically and has been sleeping it off ever since. Anyway, I heard about this thing called the B Team. And I have to admit, I chuckled a little bit at first because generally in the AG's office, whenever an attorney isn't available who does a particular type of law, 
we say, don't worry, we'll send in the B team. And of course that means, you know, these will be people that don't actually do it, but we play it on TV and we sleep at a Holiday Inn. So anyway, I'm told that you have this concept called the B team that meets to talk about referrals. And my understanding, and again, if I have the understanding wrong, my apologies in advance, is that the B team consists of all kinds of CDS personnel, special educators, related service providers, dot, dot, dot. But it doesn't include the parent. And that after the B team meets, they contact the parent and send consent to evaluate forms. This is not an IEP team meeting, obviously, but I'm not sure it even satisfies an IEP team decision without meeting because the parent is critical to any IEP team work. So I think it's very important for your planning that you make sure that the decisions about what you're gonna do in terms of evaluation for a particular student include discussions with the parent of that student. Okay. So suppose you do get your consent form back. In Maine, CDS has to conduct the initial evaluation and the IEP team has to determine whether the child is a child with a disability, in other words, whether they're eligible, within 60 calendar days of receiving parental consent for the evaluation. Now, I should have said evaluation or evaluations, but you get what I mean. So, once you get that form back, you need to have a date stamp on it. And once you date stamp it, 60 days. So IDEA and MUSER spend a lot of time talking about what it means to do an evaluation. And that's because if you remember back on the very first day, protection and evaluations is one of the key pillars of IDEA. Now, you can probably guess because you read and you saw on the first day that because of the history of discrimination against students with disabilities, it's very important that the way that it is determined whether or not a student is disabled, as opposed to something else, needs to be done in an appropriate pedagogical manner. So the evaluation process has to be multidisciplinary. It needs to use a variety of tools and strategies. And I'm gonna keep going back to this, no single procedure can be the sole criterion for making a decision. In other words, when it comes to getting your initial evaluations and deciding eligibility and what category and all of that jazz, there has to be more than one evaluation technique used. No single procedures. One thing that's been a concern, and so it's now explicitly in MUSER and in IDEA, is that the evaluation process is designed and has to reflect a student's aptitude and achievement in the area being assessed and not impairment in other areas. So let's break that apart, right? If you are trying to assess a student's OT and you can't do the assessment, because the student literally cannot sit still long enough to actually actively participate in the assessment, that is not an accurate assessment tool, right? Because all it's doing is attesting to the fact that the student has issues that prevent him or her from being able to listen to instructions, to sit calmly, to participate and follow directions, none of which, unless I'm missing something, are an OT impairment. With older kids, we see this a lot when it comes to language issues. In other words, a kid who has a limited vocabulary doesn't do well on an assessment, not because whatever they're assessing, reading, for example, it's not reading 
it's that they have a very limited vocabulary. And so unlike the rest of us who are reading along and recognizing words because we know what those words are, they don't know those words. So anyway, these assessments and the evaluations need to deal with and properly reflect aptitude and achievement in the area being assessed and not get hijacked by potential impairments in other areas. In Maine, not through IDEA, there's a requirement that an evaluation include an observation in the learning environment. So I know already you're all gonna say, but wait, we're getting kids referred to CDS who haven't been in a learning environment. You need to do the best you can to simulate a learning environment so that your evaluation can accurately observe or assess how a student behaves when they're asked to do early learning tasks. In other words, the issue here goes back to the fact that IDEA is about academic and functional performance and functional is important, but it's within the context of the education environment. In other words, to put it bluntly, it's not about a free appropriate life. It's about a free appropriate public education. So what are the early childhood pre-kindergarten expectations and how does the student perform or behave or react when they're in those settings? And then finally, your decision has to be based on the data obtained through the evaluation process and made by a multidisciplinary or in Maine, the IEP team. So another issue that's arisen over the years with IDEA is non-discrimination because IDEA specifically reflects a concern over disproportionate representation, over-representation in fact, of minority children. There also have been studies that talk about the overrepresentation of students experiencing poverty. In other words, there are a number of reasons that kids hit in the referral process that are not because of disability. In other words, there are other conditions that cause students to underperform and thus come across the IDEA radar. But the federal government has fairly consistently said that doesn't mean you identify them as students with disabilities. And so there's a requirement that tests be selected and administered in a non-discriminatory manner. Now, what does that mean? IDEA doesn't give us much on that. I mean, obviously some of the other requirements that the person administering the test is competent and authorized to do so, that the tests are tests that are generally considered to be appropriate for the age range and for the purpose that they're being used. One thing that's been suggested in the cases is that the IEP team needs to consider the effect on test performance of the student's cultural background. What does that mean? Well, I can only tell you a story from higher ed because it's sort of a famous one. One year, the SAT did a huge reading section about rowing. And by rowing, I mean the kind of rowing that you saw in Oxford Blues, you know, eight men in a boat with a coxswain and yada, yada, yada. The surprising, or shouldn't it be not surprising, thing was the extraordinary disparity among the races on that section of the SAT. And so they did some follow-up because when you have such an extraordinary gap, you have to wonder. Well, I didn't have to wonder. I mean, the reality is the average inner city student doesn't have much firsthand knowledge about rowing and spends very little of their time on the river in a skull rowing. So when you use something that's culturally out of context, it's remarkable, and the SAT study showed it, how quickly things break down. Now, of course, there are Black Americans 
who are excellent rowers, right? So all of this is based on perceptions about group characteristics. I would argue that it's very likely that white students who grow up in an inner city environment probably don't have the same level of familiarity about rowing and sculling on the river that other kids would have. But that stands out to me as an example where a very, very basic part of the SAT, reading comprehension, went horribly wrong because nobody thought about the differential experiences of the test takers when it came to doing a passage about rowing. Okay. So I'm going to say this now, even though obviously we're talking about initial evaluation, because I couldn't find any other way to put it back in and I wanted to make sure we covered it. Reevaluation is required of any student that you identify every three years unless the parent and CDS agree otherwise. In other words, it can be more frequently if the parent or CDS believes conditions warrant or you can push it out past three years. Now, obviously, while I've told you that numeracy is not my forte, I do know that at CDS, it's almost impossible to get too close to that three year mark since you're generally speaking three, four and school age five. But just in case you're dancing around three years, you have to make a deliberate decision to either do the triennial or to extend it based on an agreement with the parent. The other thing that IDEA says is that evaluations should not be more frequent than once a year unless the parent and CDS agree. And the other thing I wanna caution you about because we've had due process about this too, using the same tool repeatedly and the fact that for many tools that either limits or invalidates it. In other words, there are only so many times you can administer the same tool within a compact period of time. So you get the evaluation, it needs to have an evaluation report. Muser section 5.4.C contains a list of requirements for these evaluation reports. And when you are paying for an evaluation as CDS, you have the right to insist that the evaluation reports you get comply with this entire list. Another thing that's explicitly clear in MUSER is that an evaluation report shall not make eligibility or placement determinations. Many of you have been in trainings with me before when I've talked about parent provided evaluations. And of course, my typical example is the one that I saw probably 15 years ago now that says student has autism student requires 30 hour a week ABA program. Well, there you go, right? Now, notably, there was no other information in the report, but for two sentences, it was pretty darn clear where it was going. That is not an evaluation report contemplated by MUSER. The other thing to know about evaluation reports is that they must be provided to the parent at least three days before the IEP team meeting at which the evaluation will be discussed. So, question that frequently comes up, can a parent waive that? I would say yes, they can, but you need to get it in writing and it needs to be explicit as to what they're waiving. Why? because we've had disputes before when there are a number of evaluations outstanding where the parent said, oh no, no, I said it was okay to have the IEP meeting without Dr. X's evaluation, but not therapist Y. Okay, so now it's time. You're having the IEP meeting to review the evaluation data. You have to draw on information from a variety of sources. 
You need to make sure the parent is there as a member of the team. You have to have there as a member of the team an individual who can interpret the instructional implications of the evaluation results. Let's pause on that for a second because there is often an argument that people who are not, quote, licensed cannot be the person, for example, who interprets the instructional implications of the evaluation results in speech and language. Not so, say the courts. The issue is not that the evaluator or a substitute evaluator has to be on the team. It has to be someone that based on their training and experience can interpret the instructional implications of the evaluation results. If the evaluator has done his or her job, the evaluation report that you get should allow someone who is not a fellow expert to understand what is going on with the student. It's not helpful these evaluation reports are not written for their fellow professionals. It's not like, for example, where you go and get a surgical consult and the surgeon writes to the referring doctor and, well, for someone like me, I understand like one of the 32 words they're using. That's not the point here. The parent is a member of the team. The parent has to be able to understand from the evaluator what's going on here. Erin, I assume you're making that terrible face for a reason other than what I'm saying. Okay, good. Because you look like you were um, extremely displeased with what was being communicated. All right. So, final remember, the determinations are made by the team not by the evaluators, not by the parent. The determinations have to be made by the team. So we're gonna go again back to who is the IEP team? Parent, at least one regular ed teacher, at least one special ed teacher, a representative of CDS, with the authority to obligate CDS, which is a fancy term for saying the authority to commit funds at the discretion of the parent or CDS, other individuals with knowledge or special expertise about the child. And by the way, that determination is made by the party who's inviting them. In other words, the parent doesn't get to object to CDS's determination of including someone who they think has knowledge or special expertise about the child, and CDS doesn't get to complain about the person or persons that the parent thinks have knowledge or special expertise about the child. There is only one circumstance where a court has specifically held that a particular type of individual does not count as someone who can be invited because they have knowledge or special expertise about the child. Who is that person? The local newspaper. In other words, the media is not an appropriate party to an IEP meeting, even if either the parent, or I can't picture this ever happening, the school thinks they have knowledge or special expertise about the child. Of course, the school couldn't do that because there'd be huge FERPA issues. So in this case, it was the parent who wanted the local news media to have access to the IEP team and the court said no. Here it is, an individual who can interpret the instructional implications of evaluation results. And they're very clear in user that that can be the regular education teacher. That can be the special education teacher. That could be the representative CDS with the authority to obligate funds. In other words, one person can play more than one role. And for the initial IEP team meeting, if the student has been served in Part C, the Part C service coordinator is to be a member of the IEP team. So for students who are transitioning, Part C service coordinator. 
Okay, so IDEA 2004, for the first time, tried to put some parameters around when people really don't have to be at IEP team meetings. Now, part of that was definitely based on the pressure of having, in some cases, unwieldy large teams. Some of it was that meetings were getting delayed because people couldn't find all the right people. So let's think about what the options are here. The first option, when attendance is not necessary, Muser says a member of the IEP team is not required to attend an IEP team meeting, either in whole or in part, if the parent and CDS agree in writing that the attendance of the member is not necessary because the member's area of curriculum or related service is not being modified or discussed in the meeting. So let's sort of unpack this. I would argue that attendance can never be not necessary for the person who is a member of the IEP team because they are the representative of CDS with the authority to obligate CDS, right? That's always a part of an IEP team meeting. What about the regular education teacher and the special education teacher? Yes, I can picture a situation where whatever the meeting is about, you don't need either a regular education teacher or a particular special ed teacher to be present in order to conduct business. Do you need the speech therapist there if the entire purpose of the meeting is to discuss the OT eval? That's something that the parent and CDS can agree in writing for an excused, all right? But then confusingly enough, there's also something called excusal. So even though the first part is really an excusal, they say it's not necessary. A member of the IEP team may be excused from attending in whole or in part when the meeting involves a modification to or discussion of that member's area of curriculum or related service if, again, the parent and CDS need to agree to it in writing and the member submits in writing to the parent and the IEP team input into the development of the IEP prior to the meeting. So going back to initial evaluation, I do not think initial evaluation is a good candidate for excusals. And the reason is when it comes to initial evaluation and eligibility, you need to have both a regular education and a special education viewpoint. In addition, because I'm a lawyer, I have to point out, you're not talking about input into the development of an IEP. You're talking about whether or not the student is even eligible under IDEA. So I would be very, very, very reluctant to excuse members of the IEP team for the meeting where you're reviewing evaluations and determining eligibility. Careful there. So now we've got all the people in place. What does it mean to be eligible under IDEA? So step one. The student needs to be a child with a disability as defined in IDEA and MUSER. And those are specific categories. I've got them all listed here. Or for students your age, so to speak, developmental delay. So the team has to determine that the child has autism, deaf blindness, deafness, emotional disturbance, hearing impairment, intellectual disability, multiple disabilities, orthopedic impairment, other health impaired, speech language impairment, specific learning disability, traumatic brain injury, or visual impairment, including blindness, or the team has to determine that this child has developmental delay. Now, developmental delay is a permissive eligibility category, 
and it's defined entirely by the state. The state sets the age range anywhere from age three to nine, and Maine has currently determined that developmental delay can be used from age three to kindergarten age five. CDS uses developmental delay and Muser defines exactly what constitutes developmental delay. First, it defines the five domains of development as physical, cognitive, communication, social, emotional, and adaptive. A student is developmentally delayed if they are one and a half standard deviations below the mean in at least two of the five domains or two standard deviations below the mean in one of the five domains. I know I'm beating on this. That determination has to be based on more than one measure or assessment. There is no such thing as an on-off switch for developmental delay in the same way that there's no such thing for a, a one-off switch for any of the other disability categories, multiple measures. The other thing about developmental delay is that Muser states that every effort will be made to identify a child's primary disability under one of the other Part B eligibility criteria, so that developmental delay is reserved for those situations in which a clear determination cannot be made under any other category. In other words, while you absolutely should be using developmental delay as appropriate, you shouldn't be using developmental delay if a student can be properly identified under one of the other Part B categories. Okay, so step one, have a disability. Step two, do they need special education? After a pretty well publicized due process case from about eh, 12 years ago now, Muser started getting very specific. Prior to this case, there was no real definition of what it meant to need special education. And after the case, the department went back out to rulemaking and defined it. A child needs special education and related services when, because of the disability, the child can neither progress effectively in a progress effectively in a regular education program, nor receive reasonable benefit from such a program in spite of other services available to the child. So, progress effectively in a regular education program, receive reasonable benefit from their educational program. The need is best established through evidence of a distinctly measurable and persistent gap in the child's educational functional performance that cannot be addressed through services or accommodations available through the general education program. So let's unpack that. Measurable and persistent. You are not eligible, you do not need special education because of something that is temporary or passing. You are not eligible because you do not need special education, because something is out there that is completely unmeasurable. Measurable and persistent gap. And then the second part, every effort needs to be made to address what's going on with a student through services or accommodations that are available through general education. In other words, Special education only comes into play where services and accommodations that are available to all students through a general education program are not sufficient. All right, has a disability, needs special education, third part, adverse effect. Again, now it's specifically defined in MUSER. To adversely affect 
means to have a negative impact that is more than a minor or transient hindrance. Okay, that links back to need special education, not something that comes and goes. Evidenced by findings and observations based on data sources and objective assessments with replicable results. In other words, that links back to the notion that distinctly measurable and persistent gap, right? An adverse effect on educational performance does not include a developmentally appropriate characteristic of age or grade peers in the general population. I think of that sentence as meaning teenagers are gonna teenage. In other words, the fact that a teenager becomes moody and non-communicative, snaps at their parents, and engages in oppositional behavior is perhaps not itself evidence of adverse effect. It is rather, well, teenagehood. Just a reminder, the state has a required adverse effect form. You need to be using it when you make your eligibility determination. Okay, one last important piece. It has to have an adverse effect on educational performance, not just an adverse effect in the ether. So what does educational performance mean? For a child age three to five, performance in age appropriate developmental activities across the five domains of development in an education setting. That is what you are looking for in terms of educational performance. Age appropriate developmental activities across the five domains in an educational setting. The other thing to remember about eligibility is that Muser is very helpful in that for every one of the categories, Muser has an additional quote, procedure for determination, unquote, that follows the definition. So you need to use that as a checklist. In other words, you take whatever category that you're considering, and then you work your way through Muser's checklists for that particular category. And just again, a reminder, there are required forms for adverse effect, for some of the categories. Always make sure that where there's a required form in Muser, the team is using it. Okay, so, so far we've gotten from locating and identifying up until determining whether or not the student is a student with a disability. What is evidence that you have met the substantive requirements of IDEA up to and including evaluation and eligibility? First, evidence of a full and individualized assessment. Second, you show that the team decision-making process was used, including knowledgeable persons and the parent and professionals, otherwise known as the IEP team. The results of the evaluations have to be connected or lead to the interventions where you decide interventions are necessary. And the areas of need identified by the evaluation process are going to have to be addressed through the child's IEP. So in other words, all of this information that you now have that has led you to make your eligibility determination needs to literally stay right on the top of your pile because it's that information that we're gonna be talking about next week when we talk about building an IEP. You have to use that information because the first place where IEPs go wrong is where they don't line up with the information you got through the evaluation process. Okay. One more thing to touch on before we finish today's part, IEEs. An independent educational evaluation 
is one of the procedural protections in IDEA. The parent has the right to ask an LEA for an IEE at public expense if they disagree with an evaluation obtained by the LEA. If you get a request for an IEE, you have a choice. You either have to pay for the IEE or demonstrate through a due process hearing that your evaluation was appropriate. So a couple of things to say about this. First of all, there is no IEE until there's an E. Put another way, if a parent is frustrated because they want their child to be evaluated next week and your first evaluation spot is next month, it is not an IEE for them to race in and get an evaluation next week. Second thing, the choice about either paying for it or demonstrating through due process that the evaluation is appropriate. Some school districts have actually taken the second option and gone to due process. And in a couple of cases, they haven't brought their lawyer, they haven't paid a lot of money because the standard is ridiculously low. All you have to do is show that you had a qualified evaluator that they use generally accepted tools and that they produced a report that complies with MUSA. If you have those things, you have an evaluation that's appropriate. And so you don't have to pay for an IEE. All right, I'm guessing that this may have ginned up a bunch of questions. However, FAPECAT has been working hard on this. The secret code for this presentation, all right, I just have to say something on Fape Cat's behalf. He's a cat. <laughs> He's like, even I can figure out what the codes for these things are. <laughs> Humans do better. Oh my gosh. We do have some questions, Sarah. Um, okay. So I, yes, by the way, this session and the preceding sessions are being recorded. We are planning to do a more in-depth analysis or question series around this without Sarah present, but we haven't really determined how we're going to, um, you know, set that up yet. Is it going to be a drop-in session or we haven't determined that yet. So we'll let you know if that happens. <clears throat> and so these slides will be available and the um, recording will be available for people. Um, so I'm going to start with, do teams need to provide specific types of assessments being ordered? Uh, for example, psychological, cognitive, or rating scales, or is this unnecessary? Not clear on the expectations around this, thanks. Before the consent is signed, it could be documented in the written notice. So I think that the question is, do you have to determine what types of assessments are being ordered as an IP team. And I would, I want, I guess for further clarification, it's not necessarily the tool that the, that the IE, um, IEU is dis determining versus um, types of, of assessments or tools. So Sarah, like, do you want to yeah. feel that or do you want? Us to. Why don't you guys start? Because clearly you're <laughs> okay. understanding well, I mean, something about this question that I don't understand yet. So can a parent, can a parent request a, a Wyatt over a, a Woodcock Johnson? I okay. guess is so, so generally speaking, isn't that something that the IEP team would talk about? In so, other words, if there's a disagreement over a particular test. This is what I can say in practice. Okay. What you're doing is you are identifying the areas of which you want to assess. For instance, speech language, that's kind of clear. You need a speech language evaluation. But you would never determine what evaluation tool specifically a speech therapist would use because that's under the purview of their license and their clinical and professional opinion. So you, even if the parent says, I want the uh, speech therapist to do a um, self so. CTOP. Right, a CTOP, which is a reading test that sometimes speech therapies get into, speech therapists get into. Um, so parents can't pick specific assessments. They can't shop. They can't say, I don't want the WISC. I prefer 
the WJ3. You know, like they can't, or the four or wherever we're at, we're at with that. They can't really determine what type of assessments, but you do have to um, look at psychological. You have to look at all those categories under the consent to evaluate, determine whether or not, you know, if you're looking for a other health impairment, you are going to choose, you know, different kinds of, you're going to look for a psychological assessment. And under that psychological assessment, it doesn't necessarily have to be an IQ test, but it could be, it could be rating scales. It could be lots of different things. So the tools aren't specific. What you're looking at is an area that you think is um, a, an area for identified disability. Sound good? Sounds fine to me. Although I would still note that if there's an active disagreement, the parent is objecting to a particular tool, that's something that should be talked about on the IEP team. Doesn't mean that you can't, as the school, finally decide what you're gonna do or propose, but I would be cautious about simply writing off any concern that a parent had about a particular type of evaluation. And, Good and point, I think, Sarah. You would list that in the written notice under parent concerns. And I think there's been some due process around determining uh, whether a, a tool could be decided at an IP team or not. So There's a very big case that Perry Zirkel that. just talked about. And mm -hmm. he said, you cannot determine what, as long as the, um, the disability category is thoroughly evaluated, you can't pick which tool you want. So that's right. not a thing because yeah. it's within the professional's judgment of what type of tool they want to use. Right. Um, Jim Perry, I don't understand your question. An IEU has 15 days and an SAU has 15 I, days. I responded to that. So in user, it says that the IEU has 15 days where the SAU has 15 school days. So there is a differentiation in user between the 15 days versus 15 school days. So CDS, which so is an independent. So it's calendar days for CDS, the same Correct. And it's calendar days for. Yep. School days versus for the SAU. And that is in user. 4.2.e. So it's defined right there um, for you. So the CDS has 15 days versus an SAU has 15 school days. So I will say that one person said, is this specific to CDS? And it is specific to CDS. This training is. But I want to remind everybody, Part B in IDEA is 3 to 20. It's 3 to 20. We all have the same regs 3 to 20 with very few differences. One of the differences is this timeline piece. There is a difference in the timeline. By the way, in our rewrite of user, we're going to rectify that because Part B is one unit. It's one, it's one trajectory. We're all working under the same regs for Part B. That is a difference in Part B. There's some other slight variations and differences. And if you have questions about what that would be, please ask. <clears throat> um, so that's why this training is pertinent beyond CDS, in my opinion. A question about kiddos who are so low functioning that they're not able to participate and get a standard score. We sometimes get kids with severe autism or other severe disabilities, which can make it impossible to do standardized testing and get a standardized score. They clearly need services because they are so low functioning. Can we still qualify these kiddos on what can we do to use for testing in these cases? All right, that's clearly not a me test, a uh, me question, because I would have exactly zero idea what you would do next. What this would you do, educators? You would um, probably, you know, because some evaluative tools are more specific, they're basically better as you age, right? So it's very hard to get like a cognitive assessment, for instance, on a three-year-old. You can get some free cognitive assessment tests and things like that. What you would do is consider somebody like this, if they don't have a disability, such as intellectual disability or autism, which a physician may have determined prior to them becoming your referred to CDS, you would probably qualify somebody that's easily under developmental disability because they wouldn't be meeting the functional um, the functional capacity to um, meet those that requirement and you're testing over multiple assessments. So that's probably what you would do. Um, mostly a student like this potentially has, um, you know, like if they have severe autism, that's not something that you have difficulty qualifying, right? They have a diagnosis, 
there is a uh, adverse effect. They have adaptive. This they have adaptive delays. They have social delays. So you'd be looking at that, um, working with providers to understand clarity around the disability categorization or a. What's, what's the word I'm looking for, Roberta? You like give somebody a label. What's that called? I don't know, but you talk about the five domains of developmental delay. No, I'm talking about like, you know, identifying that someone has autism, for instance. I can't remember the word. Someone, someone knows what PD? I'm talking about. Are you talking about PD? No. <laughs> it's okay. Diagnosis. Thank you. Colleen is my brain. Thank you, Colleen. You always know what I'm talking about. Um, does the agreement to do a triennial, which we call reevaluation, uh, have to be at an IAP team meeting, and should there be a written notice that CDS and parent agree to extend? So the default is that you have to do it every three years. If the parent and CDS agree, you don't have to do it every three years. And the section of MUSER says that it's something that written agreement that to me suggests that it doesn't necessarily have to be in a written notice. If you have another written document signed that, you know, the parent and CDS agree not to do the triennial. We do like our written notices though in CDS, Sarah. So I would say we should do a written notice. That's a written agreement. It's our legal understanding of what each other thinks. So I'm going to recommend in that case, written notice. That's perfectly um, fine. But yeah. I would say that the law will accept anything that constitutes a written agreement between the parent and CDS. I, yeah, I'm just making that like a personal yep. choice. <laughs> so that's completely fine. Yeah, we, we may make that an internal policy for CDS. Yeah, that could be an internal policy. Very good. Um, I'd like to be sure I understand the scenarios in which IEP team member would be considered unnecessary for a meeting. I thought all members are required for a meeting. Oh, wait, Cheryl, who just visited? I saw one of fake cat's friends. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we have lots of cats and dogs popping up in these meetings. No kidding. Um, there's no, there is a legal, there is a, um, a, a in, in MUSER, we define four people that have to be at a meeting, an administrator, regular ed, a special education teacher, and the parent. Those are the four required team members, you know, um, those are the four, the, the basis of who you have to invite. Um, so you might not think that you need to invite a PT. You might not think that you need to invite a social worker. You might think that you don't have to invite someone that's not working related to your disability. So Liza, I'm hoping that that clarifies for you. Really, we want to make sure that the um, four required team members are there. And certainly if you're evaluating or working on an area where they're getting speech language services or OT services, you're going to want those related therapists there as well. They're working with the kid. You want those related service providers there as well. Now, if something happened, they couldn't attend. It was a meeting, you, you know, there are ways to waive the, um, a team member. And what you do uh, for that is to provide written input to the parent prior to the meeting to be able to waive that, so. Yep, that clarified for me. I just, I thought I had heard that at times a special educator might be not necessary and I got a little confused. Thank you. Oh yeah, no, no, always, always, always. Um, so, would different tools need to be used in an IEE than CDS to use for initial evaluation? Well, I, I have an answer, but let me hear what you think, Sarah. All right, let me tell you. An IEE by law has to comply with essentially what the district or SAU or CDS accepts for its evaluations. So in other words, if a parent wants an IEE, that doesn't mean they can just go to anyone who will write that famous two sentences that I told you, student has autism, student needs 30 hours of ABA, and have you pay for it. They have to produce an evaluation report that has the same substance as yours. So obviously they don't have to use exactly the same tools that you use. And in some cases, 
it might not be appropriate because of what I talked about before, that using a tool repeatedly diminishes it. But it has to substantively contain what you would get if you were ordering the evaluation. That's okay. Fine. Okay, so can I can I add upon that a little bit? The the issue with an IEE could be the observation in the in the educational setting, and that's where that's where um, the IEE would could present some issues for the only evaluation of uh, at the IEP meeting to determine eligibility. Okay, the reason I ask is we have a a little one who just had an eligibility meeting for speech, we found her not eligible. Her scores were very high. Mom was surprised by that and now wants an IEE um, for and that. And that is well. a reason that some people would request an IEE. That is that standard. I don't agree with these results. It's not what I'm seeing. I want to get a second opinion. That is a, a reason that you would you know, consider looking at an IEE. Really, really important thing that Sarah clarified that I want everybody to be aware of is an IEE can only happen after the original evaluation for CDS has been done. Okay, so it's not something that can happen prior to this. Now, Barbara Brown, you're on this call. Here's Oliver, beautiful kitty. Yep, here's Faith Cat. He was fussing, so clearly. <laughs> oh, everybody admire him. He's beautiful. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so. Um, there, there are times when a parent will go out and get an evaluation at their own expense, and the team can consider that. But an IE is specifically, we had the evaluation, we don't agree with your results, we're going to get an independent evaluation. Okay. Would evaluations be requested by the five domain areas along with the description of specific behaviors and concerns? No. The, you're not requesting um, the five domain. You're not a requesting a specific domain in the five domains. You're requesting evaluation for eligibility for special education, and um, you know, remember that parent saying something's wrong. I don't know what it is, and you're going to look at the five domains to try to analyze where the problem lies. So you're not saying specifically in those five domains because the five domains aren't a disability category. They're aspects of development. Right, which the five categories fall under developmental delay. So if, if we're considering developmental delay, we wouldn't do those five domains? I five didn't say that. No, oh, okay. That's, I'm just asking. I didn't say that. If you heard that, then okay. please know I did not say that. I'm okay. just saying that you wouldn't separate out one of those domains and say, this is what I want to evaluate, right? You're doing right. developmental disability or you're looking for eligibility. Okay. We're on the same page, Roberta. Phew. Okay. Parent refuses to sign parent consent and the school's right to due process on this, should it choose so, is a specific process in which we contact with DOE or simply document at WN. We are proceeding with our own. So due process is there's a, you know, go to the uh, dispute resolution session on the special services webpage. Districts can uh, create that situation for parents. They can take, um, they can file for due process when they're when there are disagreements, yes, a district can do that. Um, if for some reason we do not meet initially to obtain consent, the team agrees on all parts, I assume we still need a complete written notice to fully document, right? It's two separate questions, okay. Um, if you're talking about initial eligibility, Adam, you definitely wanna have a meeting. The only reason where you may come into a situation where you don't have a meeting is if you have an agreement without a meeting. So for a for a reevaluation, I would say that's not something you ever want to do in initial evaluation. You want to make sure you try to get parents involved. Um, you want them at the table. You want to make your recommendations. Sometimes a parent can't be or won't be involved and you could still meet as long as they have the without the parent, as long as you have the required amount of time and confirmation that they received the invite. And then of course, you can't do anything without parental consent. So that leaves you in a place where you're still trying to get parent uh, involved in the process. I hope that answers your question. Sort of thinking, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was just sort of thinking like, let's say there are some pretty serious health concerns, like, 
you know, we've had a, a parent that has had cancer and entirely unable to attend. And that was the only parent available, so to speak. So, um, you know, I, I'm just sort of wondering in situations like that, where it might be if the parents are in agreement with proceeding, but really just cannot attend because of such, something like that. Um, yes, Adam, you know, they're just always like very, <laughs> as long as the parent's on board with that, and they say, listen, I don't, I can't even, I don't even have the fortitude right now to be on a phone call. Just please, yeah. I'm in favor of this. Just document that. That's a very unusual situation where the parent's not, you know, fighting you on this. They just, they just are like, listen, I got my own, I can't do it, right? Like, please, that's what I want. So that's, that's an, that's a time where you can just document that and everybody notice and just try to, try to, if, when they have that conversation saying, please have this meeting without me, you can just that slip in there can i can you tell me about your concerns so i can document them for the purpose of this yeah. okay thanks yep uh anita mckinley do you have to have a standard score what are you talking about standard score on what so if we do a assessment let's say i do a fine motor assessment and the child can't do that assessment and i can't get a standard score and in the past there's been a lot of stress you know a lot of emphasis on you have to have standard scores to qualify a child what do you do can i can i do an observation saying and i think this child should be at this level but they just can't even participate in the test i, guess I think that and i'm going to answer and roberta sarah you feel free to chime in unless you have an answer sarah no i'm to... gonna wait and listen to what uh, okay <laughs> Because as so, you know, my knowledge of standard versus non-standard uh, scores is extremely limited, you know. So you want to use a preponderance of evidence to show that there's an adverse effect, okay? So a preponderance of evidence means that if you can't get a standard score, there's another way you try to get information, such as an observation. If a child can, his skills or her skills are so low that they can't participate in evaluation to get a standard score, that is an adverse effect. And you would list that in your evaluation report as, you know, not able to get a standard score because the child could not functionally participate in the evaluation, which indicates an adverse effect. Here's the observation I had to go along with that. All of this evidence, teacher report, parent report, indicates that we have a problem here in this area and we need to deal with it. Does that okay, make sense? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. You're I welcome. Concur. Diagnosis. Lisa Rubin knew what I was saying. Oh, diagnosis. I couldn't get that word. Um, all right, if a, if a child is not in school or daycare, so no regular education teacher, how do we cover that role in the meeting? Jocelyn, Roberta and I and the program directors are working on that very thing. So you wait for us because we're creating a policy on that. <clears throat> all right, what do we do when a child is unable to complete standardized articulation tests because they have the vocabulary, do not have the vocabulary to label the pictures required? However, their spontaneous speech reveals significant errors in their intelligibility is the moderate severe range. These are circumstances, again, Judy, you would do kind of what I said with the, um, with the other example. And I hope that um, yep. clarified for you. Um, and that is, by the way, a good example of what I was explaining earlier, right? About assessments needing to focus on what the student is able to do and not get thrown off by things that the student is not able to do that are unrelated. So in other words, if you don't have the vocabulary to label the pictures, that's not going to explain articulation, right? What that really is, is they don't have the vocabulary. So I have a question about, um, a private question about eligibility and what if the parent um, does not agree with the eligibility? You know, you're, you can, you go, we go through our eligibility forms all the time and we go through a speech language eligibility, we go through adverse effect form and we have a specific learning disability form. We go through those things, but IEP is not a consensus process. So we go through those things and the um, professional um, indicates the standard scores, the reasons for the recommendation and the team makes the determination. And sometimes the parent is not on board with that. It's fine if the parent's not on board with that. You just document that in the written notice. As an extreme example, the parent might revoke consent for initial for eligibility for special education. That's something that could happen. It happens to all of us in the field, and there's nothing we could do about that. Um, so I hope that I hope that answers your question. 
one person asked um, school days versus calendar days and noted that CDS doesn't have school days because it goes full year. Right. right I, I answered it. It was back to that 15 days versus school day, which I gave the reference for foreign users. So uh, the IEU, which is a, which is what CDS is, an independent educational unit, has 15 days versus an SAU, which qualifies under 15 school days. And Nancy Ward asks, how can you fill out speech eligibility if you don't have scores? You put moderate to severe. That's what they would need. And then you would say standard scores could not be obtained based on the student's lack of ability to inter interact to complete the evaluation. However, observations in the learning environment indicate that no one can understand this child. Now that part you want to put a little bit more delicately, but yes, you just have to explain. You just have to explain why you didn't get a standard score. And if they're too low to participate in the evaluation, that is a, an indication of adverse effect. Just that in itself. Okay, I think we have everything answered here. I think we do. I think we do. I think that um, this was a this is a great session because there's a lot going on here. Um, remember, if you have questions or concerns about any of these things, uh, go to your site director. Uh, we talk about these things all the time, and uh, please. Don't hesitate to contact us either if you have specific questions and we will see you all next week. Have a great week, everyone. Bye.